Hey, this uh, third and final session today, uh, really am excited. Uh, Pastor Mark McEwen, he is our, our upper elementary children's minister. We have a few different children's ministries here. We have our preschool minister and we have our upper elementary minister and, and each one of them have several people that work under them. But uh, I, I met Mark a long, long, long time ago. But uh, what, was, what was really cool, I remember the first time I think we met was I flew into Houston. This was back in like 1990. I flew into Houston and it's when you could still like go to the gates, you know, meet people and stuff like that. And uh, I walked out of the plane and he was there holding a sign with my name on it. And I felt like I've arrived. I'm, I'm, I'm somebody, my name, somebody's waiting to pick me up at the airport. And then we got in his old Toyota pickup and drove. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, uh, a, a covenant brother, I want you to give a great big hand for our children's ministry here. We believe, we believe the church has to be generational. We have to be generational. I said we have to be generational. Pastor Mark McEwen. Thank you, Pastor Keenan. Uh, yeah, he and I worked together for a few years. He was the youth pastor and I was the children's pastor. And whoever, whoever I, whosever idea it was, and their infinite wisdom, they put the senior pastor and all the adults on one end of the church, and they put the children's pastor and youth pastor at the opposite side of the church. And there are things we did. I think the statute of limitations have gone by. I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, uh, yes, it was. And uh, I will tell you this. I was raised in the Presbyterian church. So let's talk about children's ministry for a few minutes. I promise you I'll get you to Galveston. Uh, I'll get you out of here. But, but there's some important things I want to talk about. I was raised in the Presbyterian church. We thought the Baptists were wild because they played an extra key on the piano on the chord. I mean, they, they were wild. And, and I remember, but, but let me blow you, let me mess you up a little bit here. I was, I received Jesus Christ as my Savior in the Presbyterian church. A true conversion. Now let me blow your mind a little bit further. I was baptized with the Holy Spirit in the Presbyterian church. Now that'll blow your mind. It, it's, it's real. It's documented somewhere. somewhere. But, but let, me tell you, let me tell you how this children's ministry thing began to develop in me. I knew I was called to ministry as a teenager. Uh, but I remember when I was a child... There was no such thing as children's church. By the way, how many of you have a children's church in your, in your, in your ministry? Okay. Uh, well, I want to encourage you today. We're talking about believing in bigger. There's, there's reasons why children's ministries should begin to fall apart, but I believe God's going to make them bigger. Uh, but anyway, I remember I was sitting in church, and, and the pastor would be preaching, and it was Presbyterian. You know, just keep that in your mind a little bit. I loved God, but I remembered I'd become bored. And it made me feel guilty. And I thought, you know, God, I really love you, but I felt guilty because I was bored. And, it, and, it, and I remember I went to Bible school. Uh, I, when I went in there, I thought I was going to be the next great evangelist or whatever coming out. We all have those ambitions and dreams when we're young. But God began to bend towards children's ministry. Uh, my wife and I have been it on and, in it on and off for over 30 years. Now, if you think that's boasting, I have to tell you, this is my fifth term of duty. Okay? I've quit four times. Pastor Ken, this is my second term uh, tour. I'm sorry, tour here. <laughs> second tour here. I'm kind of like Michael Corleone. They, I keep trying to get out and they keep pulling me back in. Okay? But, but in all seriousness, my wife and I, that's, that's been our thing for all these years. And I've seen some great times but I've seen sometimes, and you know what? Everything I'm hearing with, with uh, Brother David and Pastor Steve is that um, we're not going to look on the negative. How, how about this? We're not going to believe in the negative. There's nothing wrong with looking at it. But what's great about it is we're going to see how God's going to bust it. He's going to tear it open. So I want to look at a few things. Uh, uh, you know, you get a guy up here to talk about children's ministry. You know, uh, it's funny. You did this backwards. It's kind of like past, I wound up preaching a, a few Wednesday nights, a couple, 
a couple months ago. And uh, what happened was Pastor Keenan was at a pastoral conference in San Antonio. Okay. Pastor Marty, our executive pastor, he had lost a friend. He was at a funeral in Tennessee. So Josh, our youth pastor, he's over here preaching to the, to the youth department. So they were down to the fourth tier. They got the children's pastor up here to preach. Okay. We were on the fourth tier that day. So the, the, it's kind of happened again here. You know, you start off with David Cook and then, then you get the children's pastor up here right before lunch and everybody's already sleepy and that sort of thing. But, uh, thank, thank you. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can get this thing to work. All right. How do you work these iPads, huh? Upgrade, yeah. I want us to start with uh, what children's ministry is, why it's so important. Let's turn to Zechariah chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And uh, this is kind of God's perspective of children. It says, again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts. I was zealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain, thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet Old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hands for very, uh, for very age, and the streets of the city shall be full, underline this if you underline in your Bible, of boys and girls playing in the street. I know Mount Zion is a real place, I know that, but it is also a metaphor for a, another real place we can't see with our eyes. Mount Zion is where God lives. Zion is where God lives. And you notice the na last thing that's happening there, who's playing in the street where God lives? Boys and girls are playing in the street. I teach girls and boys that when you're playing, God's living there. They may not even know it, but God is living there. I want you all to understand something about children's ministry. And we teach this, we pour this into, in, into these children's minds and their hearts. Children's, children are not the church of tomorrow. Amen. They are the church right now. They are part of the church right now. Children's ministry, part of it is, I get it, the child care. I used to be kind of rebellious against that. I get it. It's, it's a place where parents can, can take their children. They, they, they put them in, in the, to a place where the children are, are taken care of so the adults can focus on the message. I get that. I understand that. But we don't stop there. Children's ministry is not only child care. I tell you what, we're not babysitting back there. We're having church. We're having church and children's church. We're challenging girls and boys. We're teaching girls and boys. Okay, let me, let me, let me, let me let's, let's go on to another point. So that's how God sees it. I promise you, God's in here when we're having a big church, okay? But God's in there where the children are playing. He's there. He's there. And, and we want them to know that as children. Um, now, why do we minister to children? Turn to Matthew uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to go in, in a strange place. We're going to talk about the sower for a little bit. And you're going, to, you're going to say, what's that have to do with children's ministry? Watch this. The same day when Jesus went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. 
And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. I'm not going to read the rest of that for lack of, because of time. I, I, the point is in, in the first group of seeds. If you look in verse 4, it says, And when he sowed, some of the seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Y'all know the sower, right? Okay, I don't have to read the whole thing. In verse 19, Jesus gave the explanation of what he was talking about. He said, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one that catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. Um, have you noticed that, you know, when we look at the, the good soil and the bad soil and the one in the, by the way, the path and the stony ground and the thorny ground, in this particular group of people where the seed lands, they really aren't bad people. They just don't know. They just don't have a knowledge. By the way, I was reading that the other day, and it, do you notice how it says, by the wayside? It doesn't say on the wayside, it says by the wayside. Now, some, some of our other translations call it, they fell on the footpath or something like that, but it, but it says by the wayside, and I thought, well, maybe that's just the good king's language, you know. I looked it up, by is, it means by, it doesn't mean on the wayside. It means beside, it, the word is para in Greek. It means in the vicinity of. And I thought about that. I thought, you know what? Now, now don't, I, I don't want to mess up anything if you're teaching that and that's in your, go for it. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here, but I, I, it really made me ponder. I thought, what is this beside, bes, beside the wayside? And, and I got to thinking about it. You know, the, the Bible uses the way to represent different things. Uh, it, it represents a narrow path and a wide path. It, it represents the journey the church is on. It represents the journey Christians are on. And I got to thinking about that, and please don't throw me out of here for thinking out of the box a little bit, but I thought, you know, uh, it could be one of two things. It could be people that are choosing to be outside. But could it be people left outside? Could it be people, you know, I'm reminded of uh, Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34, when the multitude was following Jesus. And I preached on this a couple weeks ago. When Pastor Kenny graciously let me be up here. And you remember the multitude was following Jesus. They were following him in a way, on the way. And there were some blind guys on the side crying out. And here's the multitude, the followers of Jesus. What did they tell those blind guys? Come on in. The water's warm. Join us. Is that what they said? No, it's, well, he doesn't have the verse up there. They told them to be quiet. told them to shut up. So, so don't worry about the children. I'm used to that. So if they're talking back there, it's not going to bother me a bit. But anyway, let's think about that. Could it be that these, this word off to the side into this ground, this by the way, yeah, it could be their choice. But are we sometimes leaving people out? Sometimes, sometimes does the church need, do we need to look in the mirror sometimes and say, you know what, we need, we need to correct some things here. Maybe, maybe we're not doing some things right. Maybe, maybe we're leaving some things off to the side. Maybe, maybe the people that don't look like us or, or maybe the people that have a different background or um, maybe they have a different particular political viewpoint. Maybe we, maybe we just want them off to the side. Now, let's, let's talk about children's ministry here. Maybe kids get in our way a little bit. Let's just keep them off to the side. Let's give them some candy. Let's play some games. Let's just kind of keep them off to the side. Don't let them get in the way. Don't let them get in the way. Does anybody know who George Barna is? Um... George Barna uh, 
set up a statistic, and this thing is probably more than 10 years old, so it's probably a lot worse now. If you've got a place, make a mental note or write it down. This has been my theme the past half of my being in the, in the children's ministry. Remember these two numbers, 33-4. 33 4. 33, 4. What does that mean? There is a 33% chance that a person will receive Jesus Christ as their Savior through elementary age. 33, that's one third. The day they go into middle school, that drops down to 4%. 33, 4. It's probably a lot worse. 33, 4. So, how many believe in investments? Investing in good things. When do we invest in a person's life? When do we target them to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior? When is the best time, uh, the best percentage of a chance is those elementary age years? Now, listen, God's not worried about percentages. I know that. God is not a statistician. Stat did I say it right? Statistician, thank you. We know God can break through that. In fact, you probably, some people in this room are saying, wait a minute, I was saved when I was 20-something. You know what, though? I would venture to say, I bet you 99% of the people that say they were saved when they were young adults or, or even when they were, were exposed, a seed was planted in their life when they were a child. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Now's the time to minister to children. Right now. I want to get into some other statistics. I'm going to hurry on here, but I, I, I think this is important. Um, George, there's a, an article, Pastor Keenan sent it to me a few weeks ago. And the title of this article is The Children's Pastors. And it's, it's by a guy named, guy named Dale Hudson. He's a, he's a known guy with children's ministers. And he, the title of this article is, Are Your Cute Lessons, Talking to Children's Pastors, Turning Kids into Atheists? Let me read you some statistics real quick. There's a, the, the generation coming up now, we have the X generation, the Y generation, millennials. The next one's called the, the Z generation. And Do you want to hear what they're going to believe or why they won't go to church? Let me tell you why. Now remember, these are statistics. Don't throw me out of here. We know God's going to break through these things, but, but we, need to, we need to know what's going on. 29% say, I have heard, I have a hard time believing that a good God would allow so much evil and suffering in the world. 23% say Christians are hypocrites. Well, join the club, okay? Uh, I'm a hypocrite. I, I admit it. You know, we always have that little place, but that seems to be a catchphrase. Anyway, 20% say I believe science refutes the Bible. 19% say I don't believe in fairy tales. 15% say or will say there are too many injustices in the history of Christianity. 12% say, I used to go to church, but it's just not that important anymore. 6% say, I have bad, had a bad experience in church or with, at church or with a Christian. 37% believe it's not possible to know for sure if God is real. 58% believe many religions can lead to eternal life. Listen to these last few. 46% say, they need factual evidence to support their beliefs. We need to be prepared to do that. We don't need to be afraid of these questions from people that don't believe. We don't need to be afraid of, of children coming with these questions. 49% say the church seems to reject much of what science tells us about the world. You know, did you know, I, I, you know, there, there's this... We, we had this battle between science and Bible. Did you know it intersects many times? There are many times the Bible intersects with science. In fact, true science, there are scientists who are atheists that the further they studied into whatever, whatever their field was, ge, uh, ge, geology or biology, they became Christians. Uh, the man, uh, Coco, is that how he pronounces his name? The one that founded the string theory... A physicist, a, one of the greatest mathematicians, 
He recently, within the past year, said, he, I mean, he's this physicist, humanistic guy. He's, he's studying this thing. He's, he says, he throws his hands up and he says, there has to be a designer. We don't need to be afraid of this stuff. If we jump, the Holy Spirit's in that stuff too. God made it. He spoke it into being. He knows how it works. What are we afraid of? I'm not afraid for science to attack us because what's going to happen is they're going to find out science is going to prove God sooner or later. So when people say these things, when people say these things, we don't need to, we don't need to guard up against that. Let it come. Come on. 27% say church is not a safe place to express doubts. It should be. People should be able to walk into our church and say, help me, I don't believe in God. Help me, I see injustices. Is that going to hurt our little heart? Are we tougher than that? Are we going to lay down when we're hearing parents aren't bringing their kids to church anymore? Oh my, oh well. Are we going to give up? When, when millennials come in and they say, when, when, they, when they finally get here, they're saying, I want you to answer me some questions. No, no, you just sit down and shut up and listen to me. No, are we going to let them come in and say, help me with my doubts? Listen to this one. Now, this one hit me as a children's pastor, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Pastor, I'm trying to hurry up here. Okay. 24% say that teaching, the teaching they're exposed to is shallow. You know what? Us children's pastors in the past have been the most guilty of that. How many of you know uh, the name Betty Botts? For those of you who know Betty Bott, she was, uh, I went to International Bible College and, and God used, she is the Kung Fu world master of children's ministry. Uh, she passed away a few years ago. She, she was it. I mean, if, if, if when you hung around her, it didn't take long. She understood children's ministry. And, and in the midst of that, um, she told us some things. She told us, she gave us a warning. She told us that while we're ministering to kids, if we, I gave up on my iPad. She told us while we're ministering to children, it's not enough to teach children to memorize all the books of the Bible. It's not enough to have children memorize tons of Bible verses. Now stay with me. Don't throw me off the stage yet, okay? I can memorize Mary had a little lamb, but if I don't know what it means, it's not going to do me any good. It's not enough in children's ministry just to learn Bible stories. It's not enough to just eat candy and have fun. We give out candy more than anybody. That's not what I'm saying. Stay with me. It's not enough to teach children biblical principles. It's not enough to have cutesy little lessons. She says, if you, if you finish your children's ministry throughout your life and that's what you've done, you have failed. Betty Botts told us that. Let me tell you something about teaching the kids about the Word of God. We need to teach them there. It's not another book laying in the library. It's not a thing you just memorize so you can learn how to do good stuff throughout your life. It is God's words. It is God's words. How did God create this universe? With his words. He spoke. He spoke. He spoke. Let there be. Let there be. Let there be. And then he put them in a book. That's a miracle. God's words. And teach the kids, you'll never finish this book. It's alive. With the Holy Spirit, you can read this book a million times and you will never, from cover to cover, you will never finish it. Uh, I, I like to, on Sunday mornings, the kids start getting hungry because sometimes Pastor Keenan gets a little winded, you know, and keeps, and they're back there and it's almost lunchtime and they're hungry. So, so I, I start messing with their appetite. I t you know, my wife this past Sunday, she made uh, our kids and grandkids come over. She made, she made some enchiladas, homemade from scratch with chicken cooked in a crock pot for four hours. 
And I told, I told the kids, I was telling them, you know, how many of you want a hamburger right now? Oh, they're, they're yelling at me. Stop it. Stop it. We're hungry. How many of you want that French fry with the ketchup? Oh, Pastor Mark, quit, quit. We're hungry. I said, how many of you want to be hungry for the Bible like that? And they got it. And we had a prayer time that this past Sunday where we were asking God to make us hungry for his word. Just, 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 like, just like we are for food. Just like we are for food. Make them hungry. Let's finish. Okay, I'm not even going to say that. Okay. Put my, put my thing up there, my last one. I don't even know where my notes are now. Put uh, the Bible, the... Uh, this is... This is uh, I can't even remember what. I got so excited, I can't remember what I'm talking about anymore. Uh, yeah. Mark chapter 10, verses 13. Re- let's read this. It says, this, this, this is our goal. It's not just the teaching the Bible verses, and it's not just memorizing the books of the Bible. Yes, do all those things are important, but here's the goal. Here, here's the punchline. And they brought young children to him that he should touch, touch, touch them and his disciples rebuked those that brought them next verse but when Jesus saw it he was much displeased and said unto them suffer the little children to come unto me if you don't like it suffer now that's not really what that means but I, I kind of And forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Oh, my favorite verse in the whole Bible. God, let me stay a kid. And he took them up in his arms and put his hands on them. And bless them. Our goal in children's ministry is to make sure all those other things they've got to have, those are the tools, but make sure they have a touch from Jesus. Senior senior pastors, what do we do? And this is where I'm at. this may be where I get thrown off the stage. And let me encourage you, promote your children's department. Promote your youth department. It's not going to promote itself. Now, yes, part of a senior pastor's job is to, is to promote things. That's, that's true. I get that. But if we're doing our job, we're back there doing the children's ministry thing with our team. A little something I've learned about leadership. When we shine stuff up around us and, and shine it up and shine it up, that reflection begins to shine off of us. You get what I'm saying? Say things like, man, I got the best children's ministry in the state. You ought to see my youth pastor. He is the best youth pastor anybody can have. Shine him up. Um, when, by the way, when you're looking for a children's pastor or a youth pastor, find somebody that's a little bit rebellious. Now, I'm not, not the witchcraft kind, okay? I'm not talking about that kind. I'm talking about the kind that thinks a little bit outside the box. Um, the one, the, the one servant says, I'm not going to do it, and then you turn around and he's over there doing it. You know, he's got, got a little bit of that streak inside him because he's the guy that's going to do something. He's, pick someone that's going to challenge you a little bit. I mean, I'm not saying they're, they're anarchists and they're not teachable. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone that's got a little get up and go inside of them. The, the, they're a cannon that's a little bit loose. You've got to tighten them up every once in a while. You don't, you don't want a cannon that you can't get to do anything. Yeah. Right? Praise the Lord. I'm out of time, okay? But, but uh, was that okay? Did you get that this morning? And, and uh, let's, remember those, let's remember that soul that's a little bit off the way. Not just with kids, but, but as we live our life. I, you know, I want to see that 33-4 thing go away. Um, um, 
things might be swaying and, the, and beginning to turn in the right direction, but how long is that going to last? You know, it could, it, could be, it could reverberate the other way at any time, even worse. But you know what? God, God's not worried about that. God's not afraid. God's not scared of 33-4. He's not afraid of all these things. He's not afraid of what, what we see in politics or what he sees going on in Florida or whatever. God, God's excited. God's already there. Can you imagine God, is, God isn't on our little timeline. He's, up, he's in a helicopter watching the parade. He is already there. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Pastor Keene. Father, we come before you, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity you have put our lives into. Sometimes we read uh, places in the Old Testament and think, think, man, I wish I would have lived then. Or sometimes we read the, the great times when the New Testament was being written. In New Testament times, the birth of the church being on earth with Jesus in his physical body. And sometimes we might would say, man, I wish I lived during that time. But God, we could be living in the greatest time. Lord, we, we could be living in the time where in all eternity we'll look back and say, man, what a ride. Lord, I pray that you bless all the pastors here. Lord, I pray that you bless all their children's ministries, their youth departments, their church as a whole. And Lord, we're not going to dwindle away when the statistics tell us we are, God, you're going to raise us up. And God, we're going to do mighty things for you, both in children's ministry, adult ministry, ministry, youth ministry. God, your church is going to shine. It's going to be a bride prepared for the bridegroom. We thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Well, we'll give you just a few minutes. Uh, Pastor Marty, is the bus out here? It is, okay. We're, we're going to, I've got uh, 1157 right now. Why don't we make it a, <laughs> I'm going to be confusing, a hard 1208 and we'll leave. So that'll give you time to go to the restroom, drop some stuff off if you need to. For everybody that's registered to head to Galveston, uh, the restaurant is waiting on us.